I'm pleased to introduce my friend, Samantha Kevern, who um, has a higher degree of engineering license than I do. She's a uh, licensed structural engineer, which is a big deal. Um, she is currently a bridge construction engineer with over 15 years. Bridge design, bridge construction, and bridge demolition. And in fact, her uh, she's on a technical committee that just finished just finished a formal engineering guidance document on bridge demolition. As you can imagine, it's not a small thing. She has worked on projects in 28 states, including the erection. The Erection Engineering for Children's Mercy Park, the Sporting KC Soccer Stadium, the, do, the design of the Kuchawesco Bridge, which is the first cable. Sorry. Cable. Oh, no, we're not doing so no. big systems. <laughs> the first cable state bridge in New York, and cable state bridges have the straight cables. Suspension bridges have the big swooping. For your building work on the Golden Gate Bridge, which is a suspension bridge, uh, construction of the Inner Harbor Navigation Channel, flood wall of New Orleans, and et cetera, et cetera. She is the technical manager. Colorado. Um, and she's also an active member, but this is where this uh, report came out of, of and the American Society of Civil Engineers National Temporary Works Committee. She has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Wisconsin, Blackville, and a master's degree in civil engineering from Ohio State University, Iowa State. From Iowa State. Iowa. What did I say? Doesn't Iowa. matter. Doesn't matter. Iowa State. Cyclones. Um, uh, and she's also very real more fun human being. And I'm delighted that she was able to carve out time in her schedule to talk to us about bridges. Okay. I need to share the screen just a moment. I love the complete contrast in what <laughs> Buster just presented, and now we're getting into um, the world of bridges, which I think is still aesthetically pleasing. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not always, but when done well. Uh, is this an advanced slide? It should. Okay. No. Every, everything you want to know about bridges and probably a few things that you don't. Um, this was a challenging group to prepare a presentation for. I do a lot for my peers who are highly technical, and we get you know really down to the weeds. Um, I do a lot of student outreach, which is, you know, presenting bridges to an eight-year-old is different. You all are obviously very competent, uh, but you don't have the same depth in bridges. And so that uh, hopefully I kind of hit the right amount of uh, big picture and in getting into details. Sure. The, the focus is right here. Go so, on. Try it now. Yep. Okay, we'll, we'll start with some bridges. I hope you all recognize where this is at. Obviously not current. This is uh, right here in Kansas City. Um, the new Buck O'Neill Bridge. This was before construction. Uh, we have the Broadway Bridge in the foreground. There is a, a truss railroad bridge right behind that. Farther, we have another truss lift span for a railroad bridge. The Heart of America Bridge is the green span that's behind that. And then we have um, the, well, the Kit Bond Bridge. I still like to call it the Paseo. So that's a cable stay bridge. If you remember the old Paseo Bridge, that was a suspension bridge. So I love right here in Kansas City, we have an excellent view of bridge types. So big picture overview. Here are the seven say, most common types of bridges. So we have truss bridges up on the top left. Uh, the top right cantilever, that's usually a cantilever truss. So it's just a slightly more complex truss, longer spans. 
Then we have the cable stay bridge. Again, that's where the cables directly go from the tower to the bridge deck. We have suspension bridges, which are where our main cables go between the towers, not down to the bridge. And then we have our secondary cables that go from the main cable to the bridge deck. Uh, we have two different types of arches. So we have what we would call a deck arch. It's where the deck goes on top of the arch. And then we have tied arches where, where our cables are supporting the bridge. And then uh, the standard beam bridge, which is probably the most common bridge type that you see, highway overpasses and whatnot. That doesn't get into movable bridges. So here's another level of complexity. Um, these are three main types of movable bridges. First, we have a swing span on the left. That's where the bridge physically will swing open to allow ships to pass and then swing back close. Um, a bascule bridge, it's not a drawbridge. Those are actually different things. A bascule bridge has a giant counterweight in that base and that's what makes it open and close. Um, you know, the, the drawbridge is more of like medieval castle type short spans where we're raising and lowering. We don't use those for infrastructure. And then we also have lift bridges. So again, that's going to lift the bridge up out of the way to allow ships to pass, set it back down. Now you can imagine these are even more complex than a typical bridge because now we're moving something that weighs millions of pounds. So besides the structural engineers, we also work with specialized mechanical and electrical engineers. So these are very complex structures. A few Random facts, a little bit of bridge history. Generally speaking, in the US, our materials keep getting better. We come up with different material types, different processes. The steel we have now, significantly stronger than what we had in the 70s. The steel from the 70s, significantly stronger than what was available in the 50s, significantly stronger than what was available as wrought iron in the 1800s. So that lets us start to push the envelope. We can make things longer, bigger, um, the only exception is timber. And this isn't just for bridges, but this is all construction. Wood has gotten weaker. We're not cutting down old growth forests anymore. I hope we're not. Anything that's left that's old growth, we've now protected. We don't want to cut that down. A timber from the 50s, significantly stronger than the same size what we can get today. So whether it's for temporary construction or permanent construction, the wood we have now is not as good as it was in the 70s, which is not as good as what you could have gotten in the 1800s. So that's the one big difference. We don't use timber much on uh, public infrastructure anyway. Um, there are very, very few bridges that were built in the 1940s. Hopefully you all know why the eight-year-olds uh, eight don't ever understand this. Uh, but a big part of what I do is demolition. And I can tell you about different decades of bridges and what they're like. And there's almost nothing built in the 40s. Obviously, it's steel that I'm just going for the war effort. We just... We have a decade where almost nothing happened in our country's infrastructure, which it's it to me it's always really neat to kind of see, it's still get to see things aren't that old. We still feel the effects of what was happening in the early 1900s and the mid 1900s. Um, the cable state bridges are what I'm going to call the youngest bridge type that we have. They did not exist until the 1970s. They started in France, they were brought over to the U.S. in the late 1970s. We have not taken down any cable state bridge yet in this country. So that's how new they are. We couldn't do cable state bridges until we had computer programs. So a suspension bridge you can actually do the engineering for by hand easier than what you can for a cable state bridge. So suspension bridges are much older than what the cable state bridges are. Um, and most of our bridges that are part of public infrastructure are open to public record requests. There's some uh, exceptions. We have decided after 9-11 that there are infrastructure that's critically sensitive to the security of our country. That's not just bridges. It also includes some dams, ports, airports. For these bridges, you have to have a background check to even work on the bridge. I worked on a project in New York City. I had to have a background check, fingerprinted the whole nine yards. I had to have a bag with my photo ID even to get on site. Those projects, you cannot submit a uh, Freedom of Information Act to get those claims. So there, there's some exceptions that we have for obvious reasons. Okay, I, I could not give a presentation to formal faculty without having a little bit of a pop quiz here. So apologize for the, uh, the, the typo there. Approximately how many bridges do you think there are in the U.S.? And I have, you know, A, B, or C up there. 75,000, which would be the equivalent of about 1,500 per state. 
assuming they're equal. Obviously, they're not. Rhode Island does not have as many bridges as, say, California. But just, you know, we're, we're taking the average. 300,000, 6,000 bridges per state. 600,000 or 900,000. So you don't have to answer out loud. And then before I get to the answer, what percentage of those do you think are in poor condition? Now, luckily, there's nothing above 10%. So we know at least there's, you know, it has to be less than 10% that's in poor condition. We, we would hope it's on the lower end. Um, but it's not zero, unfortunately. So we have you know, 10, 6.8, 5.1, 3.3. You don't have to answer out loud. So the answer to the first one is 600,000. Now that is public inventory. What that means is that is what is owned by you know, states, counties, um, public entities, does not include railroad structures. The railroads are like their own sovereign country. They, they have their own rules. They are not required to meet federal standards. Um, that also does not include things like pedestrian bridges or you know, small off system bridges. So that's just what is owned by public entities. Of that, 6.8% as of 2021 are in poor condition. Now that number has come down back around 2013, I think it was closer to 8%. Um, in the mid kind of 2000s, the 20 teens, we made some really good progress in bringing that number down. We stalled out a little bit with uh, less funding for infrastructure. So the total poor condition is 40,000 800 bridges again across the country. I don't think any one state has more than two or 3,000 that are in need of replacement. Which you're like, that still sounds high. But worse, we're, we're, we're trying to um, get those replaced. At the same time, we have over 76,000 that actually need to be replaced. Now, why is the difference? We have 40,000 that are, are poor condition, but we're saying 76,000 need to be replaced. Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is that some of those 76,000 were designed back in the 70s or in the 50s with different design standards. They don't meet current safety standards. So it could be the bridge is in good condition, but the curve right up, you get off the bridge is way too tight and you need to change the alignment because a lot of accidents happen there. Or the bridge is in good condition, but it's using Stanford 10 foot uh, roadway width with a two foot shoulder. If you've never had to drive across a two lane bridge that's only 24 feet wide, be thankful. It is scary when you are trying to go down a 10-foot lane with a semi-truck coming in the other direction. <laughs> so those the bridges could be in good condition. They just don't meet our current standards. There's other bridges that they're in good condition, but maybe we only have two lanes. We really need four, and we end up with huge traffic backups. So that's why the 76,000 is higher, even though the total that's in poor condition is only about 40,000. Okay, so to go go back to you know US, a little bit of a history lesson here too. So what what is required for our bridges? And anything that's owned by a public owner, again, state DOTs, you know, large cities, county municipalities, their bridges are required to meet the standards set out by AASHTO. We have lots of acronyms in engineering. That's the American Association of State and Transportation, State Highway Transportation. I think I put it there. It's a lot of letters. There, there's an overall entity. This entity is made up of all the different states. So every state gets a representative to sit on this committee. They're the ones that set up the rules. Every public bridge has to meet these standards. And then the owner can decide that, well, I'm going to require something extra. So California has additional requirements in certain areas for seismic. Um, Louisiana has additional requirements for hurricane winds, temporary and permanent structures. So all of the states will say, okay, we're, this is the minimum, is our AASHTO standard. We're gonna require you to do a little bit more depending on where it's located. Um, that's the design part. We also have this maintenance piece. Again, we have a lot of bridges that were built in the 50s, in the 70s. These aren't new bridges anymore. Uh, so we have to maintain them. And part of that is regular inspection. And so that's where the National Bridge Inspection Standards comes in. That was started in the 70s. It wasn't very highly enforced up until 2007. If any of you remember, in 2007 was when the I-35W bridge in Minneapolis collapsed during rush hour. 
Now, I'm, I'm guessing you're not a bridge engineer, so you probably don't remember all the investigations, but what happened is there was a cracked gusset plate in a truss structure. Trusses are what we call fracture critical, meaning they're very sensitive to one bad thing means a whole bridge falls down. They're not very redundant. So there was a cracked gusset plate that had been cracked for a while, had it been inspected, had it been shut down, they could have prevented this from happening. So then we went back to the NBIS. We said, no, every bridge has to be inspected every two years. Doesn't matter if it's brand new. It's a brand new bridge is being inspected here too. Now we have additional requirements on top of that. So if a bridge is in poor condition, that's not actually the worst. There's, there's one worse, which is, uh, I think, structurally deficient. If you get to those bottom, you have to inspect more often. It's a good thing, right? If you're telling me that that bridge isn't in good shape, somebody has to be out there every six months now. Well, owners don't want to do that. So that's when we start to replace bridges, when we start having those really high maintenance costs. And fracture critical bridges are, are truss structures. They have additional inspection requirements. So for the trusses, we have to do what's called a hands-on inspection, which means you have to look at everything close enough you can touch it. So if you look at some of these big bridges that are over high waterways, that's labor intensive. That's some guy in rope skier that has to climb off a bridge, rappel off a bridge. That is somebody being on the other side of a truss that's laying closures. Like those are big investments, but it's what has to be done. Uh, we are moving towards trying to do some of this with drones. Makes sense, right? The, the problem is it isn't tested. We don't have research data that shows there are projects going on right now with universities and owners that the universities are doing the, the drone studies, the capture, mapping everything. And then we're also doing the hands-on inspection so we can get numbers to show that drones can do this stuff. I think we'll get there eventually, but we, we don't just make changes. You know, again, this all comes down to public safety. So other things that have changed, again, as, as somebody that has gotten to work on old bridges, to me, the history of bridges is just fascinating. When you have weaker materials, you're limited with what you can build. So when you have short spans, when you have shorter lifespans even, you don't have the same concerns. Well, now we start getting into longer lifespan. And there are things that we didn't know about steel until after we started building bridges because we had never let bridges last this long. We had never built bridges this long. So you go back to the 50s and beyond, we had fairly short spans and we didn't have to worry about fatigue. So fatigue is repeated loading. If you think about you know, driving over the same thing over and over, if you've been a paper clip back and forth enough, eventually it's gonna snap. That happens with steel just on a much bigger level. Well, as bridges get longer, as a lifespan gets longer, that fatigue becomes a bigger piece. So we didn't even know what fatigue was. We didn't pay that much attention to fracture critical material behavior prior to the 50s. So we didn't have to, our, our bridges didn't see those loads. So we get to the 70s and all of a sudden we start having steel cracking. If you can imagine what it takes to crack one inch plate steel, that's significant loading. I mean, these have significant impacts. So now all of a sudden we're needing to work with our university partners and researchers to figure out how do we prevent this? How do we design so we don't have this problem? We know a lot more now. We don't have as many issues. Can't say no issues. We don't have as many issues because we know a lot more now. But our knowledge around fatigue and uh, material fracture really didn't start until the, the 50s and the 70s. I worked on a project, again, different bridge in New York that had some fracture issues. And one of the experts on our team was Dr. John Barsom, who was one of the authors of the barsom rolf equation, which is how we quantify fracture toughness in materials. I got to sit next to the guy that developed the equation. This stuff isn't old. This is still fairly new. I, you know, like, I, I like what I do. It's exciting. This is neat that I get to, you know, sit next to the guys and figure out how to fix this for the first time in history. Can they fix that? Uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> yes. With enough time and enough money, we can solve any problem. And I... <laughs> I tell my uh, young engineers, even my boss sometimes, the same thing. With enough time and money, we can engineer anything. The, the problem is we don't often have unlimited funds or time. Um, for, for something like fatigue and fracture, 
you have to provide an alternate or improved load path. You can't just, you know, weld this back together and it'll be fine. It's like putting a band-aid on a broken boat, but that doesn't work. If you were to add additional steel, change your cross frames, put in a second load path, you could fix this. So, yes. <laughs> Another big development that really is recent is our ability to use computers to do design. So again, cable state bridges were not possible before the 70s. We just didn't have the technology to do it. What we can do now with bridge design, it's, it, it's phenomenal. Um, I've spent a lot of my career actually doing high level finite element modeling on complex structures. And it is, it, it is so much fun. It's like a puzzle. I mean, you got to figure it out and then you have to look at it, you know, on the high end and on the low end, and then you try to bound. We don't really know what's going to do. We kind of think we're close. You hope you get some, you know, good numbers that back everything up, but we can do so much more now than we ever used to. If you want to ask me what is the worst decade of bridge to take down, it's the 1970s. I hate those bridges. Oh, they're awful. Because we figured out with computers that, oh, we can optimize these bridges. We can use the minimum amount of steel possible that still makes it work when everything is together and it's all in one piece. And that's what we did. I've seen bridges where like every five or six feet, they're changing plate size, which is not efficient from a building standpoint. But then when you start to take it down because they were optimized up to the limit, they have no extra capacity. So now when you're trying to take them down, oh, they're a nightmare. It's a complete liability. And so we, we, we got through our initial like, hey, look what we can do. We're so excited. We can, you know, shave this stuff down. And then we realized that this isn't the best way to do things. We need to take a step back. In the U.S., material costs do not govern any infrastructure project. It is never how much the steel costs, how much the concrete costs. It is more about the labor and the design behind it. So in the US, we need to optimize labor, fabrication, transportation costs. How do we shorten our construction schedule? That's what drives costs in the US. In other countries where you know they might pay people a dollar a day to work, you can your, your labor isn't going to drive anything. I'm not saying that that's that I actually that I have bigger problems with that. I would rather be. Um, you know, set up the way we are here. But so optimizing each section doesn't make sense anymore. It causes us more problems in the field. It causes us more problems long term. So now we have to do a holistic balanced design. And I would say this problem we're seeing even more, not a problem, it's a challenge. If you think about the way our cities are set up, we don't have just open spaces everywhere. It's easier here in the Midwest for us. We do have a lot more space than say New York City. When you're at full build and you have to get construction equipment in or out, you have to shut down a tunnel, a highway, that's a big hassle. But even here in the Midwest, I mean, I was talking with Deb earlier about um, that bridge name is, is driving me crazy. I-70 between, you know, here in Columbia, there's a truss bridge that's being replaced. I think they have the new traffic switched over on one lane because they did take down one span. Um, when they would shut down a single lane to inspect that bridge, traffic would back up for seven miles. Missouri, right? This isn't New York City. This isn't, you know, California. This is just, there's so much traffic on our interstate system. Going from two lanes to one lane causes big problems. So we need to think about how to minimize all impacts, not just the engineering part. Um, I mean, what else has changed? Climate change. And this one is huge. So I've been doing this 16 and a half years, almost 17 years. I started in, you know, 2007 was when I started my career. Um, in talking to some of our new hire employees, I feel old, but at the same time, I know I'm not that old. I know uh, I'm, I'm mid-career and I have seen a ton of change. Well, we are seeing higher wind speeds without a doubt across the country. We are seeing higher wind speeds related to hurricanes. And actually just in the last two weeks, NOAA came out and they said, we, the next big climate risk that we're facing is a hurricane that is beyond the category five. Wind speeds that we haven't even quantified. We're gonna see it in my career. We are seeing more big storms. The 100 year storm is no longer the 100 year storm. You know, there are places in this country that the 100 year storm has happened three times in the last decade. 
We are seeing floodwaters that exceed the 100-year flood limits, mudslides, or, or wildfires. I mean, the stuff goes on. And so politics aside, you know, you can believe what you want to believe, but we have the data that shows this stuff is happening at a higher level and it's happening more often. So what does that mean? As a design engineer, all of those codes, the ASHTRA that I referenced earlier, it's all based on statistical analysis. The, the structural engineers aren't setting those numbers. We're working with the data scientists and the people that gather the information and a whole bunch of really smart statisticians that will say, okay, so the probability of this happening in 100 years is less than 3%. We're going to use that as our probability of exceedance. We're going to design for this as our 100-year event. Well, it's not 3% anymore. Now it's 50%. So that probability of exceedance doesn't work. That means our baseline assumptions are no longer conservative. As a bridge engineer, I'm being asked to work with the hydrologic engineers far more often than we ever used to because of flood concerns. So there's there's a lot of very real um, climate change that's that's happening, I mean, actively. And so the other thing too, again, it's not like we have one bad storm year and the country as a whole goes, oh, we need to update and change this stuff. It typically takes 10 years for this type of data to make its way into the codes. I've seen wind speeds increase three times in my 16 year career. That means it's been increasing for at least 25 to 30 years. So don't think that this is just, you know, within the last year or two that, oh, we have a bad hurricane season, all of a sudden we're gonna make changes. That's not the way. You guys know the way the speed government works. Like nothing happens that fast. This stuff has been in the works for a while. And so we have to pay attention to it. The other thing that I forgot to put up here, um, a little bit more lighthearted, is environmental impacts. And again, I fully believe, you know, we should try to preserve pristine wilderness, things like that. But uh, I have had to learn about nesting habits of peregrine falcons. <laughs> I, I spent a significant amount of time learning about the uh, mating habits of shellfish on the East Coast. Um, and then I'm working on a, a project right now where we have to consider the native eel grass and try to protect that. So I, I've had a few days, it's like, man, I thought I went to school for structural engineering, and here I am working up the mating time with the shellfish on the East Coast. So, you know, again, for me, it's always interesting where you know, there, there's so much coordination involved in these things. And it's really easy to put your blinders on and be like, okay, as an engineer, this is what we need to do. When you start considering the community and the environment and the people who live there, okay, the shellfish are important. You know, I, we'll, we'll do it. So that's, um, I feel like we're, we're seeing more of that too. And again, I just part of the job. It's just interesting observation that, you know, 15, 20 years ago, we weren't as concerned. And now we are. And again, it's, for those communities, it is important. You know, the local, it was the local shellfish protection community that was adamant that, you know, we couldn't be in the water during their specific mating seasons. Okay, you guys know more about shellfish than I do, but I guess I'm going to learn. Um, delivery methods has also changed, and this is one that I, I think probably impacts the engineers more than the public, but uh, 50 years ago, we always did what we called design bid bill. So the owner would say, we need a new bridge. We're going to hire an engineer to do the design. Engineer would do the design, they would put it out for bid, contractor would bid, bid, build exactly what was bid. That's fine, that method is still used now, but now we started to get into alternate delivery. So if you've heard about public-private partnerships, or P3s, uh, design build, CMGC. So we have different ways to build and they all involve different levels of risk management is where it comes down to. But trying to get the contractor on board sooner so we can understand how it's going to be built as we're doing this. So it's important when you're talking about, um, it, Missouri does a ton of design build here, but when you're talking about cities and you're trying to manage traffic flow, traffic patterns, at least have the best idea. Sometimes the guy who's building it does actually know more. Don't tell my colleagues I'm saying this out loud. Sometimes they know more and they know how to get it done faster or better or reduce risk. So bringing the contract of contractors on board earlier or going to a design build where the contractor and the engineer are the partners, um, it can have benefits. Now there's there's cons as well just with anything. Uh, there's not one method that's better than the others. The impact that it's had on the engineers though is it speeds up the timelines. 
So those nice design good build jobs, they're kind of cushy with this. <laughs> in the same job for a long time and might take a year or two to deliver. Like that's great. But if you are working for a contractor, they have a very different mentality when it comes to schedule and what they want. So uh, it requires a lot more adaptive engineering when you get into some of these alternate delivery. Question. Yes. How do you then competitively bid a project like that if the contractor needs to be there before you know what you're going to build? So the it depending on the, the model, sometimes the contractor has to pick their partner early. And so these companies will pursue jobs for a year or more. And they will do their research. They will have meetings. They will talk to the owner. Um, so the first step is usually you have to provide a statement of qualifications. So you have to go through and you know, provide a resume for your contractor and your engineer. How many bridges have you designed and built? Who's gonna be running the job? Once they get their statement of qualifications, they will have a short list of people that are then invited to actually put in a proposal. So then you'll have this proposal phase that will have all of your technical statements, again, resumes, key personnel. They usually will interview three and they have a big technical score sheet. It, it's a production. It, it's a huge. It's a huge production, um, and it's really competitive. And when you win one of those, it's like winning the Super Bowl. It's like, yes, you, I mean th these are uh, hundreds of millions, sometimes into the billion dollar price tag. So it's uh, a lot of effort goes into that on both sides, on on the owner side trying to select, but then also on the contract and the engineers to put together the best team to try to win this job. Okay, another another question. A typical bridge. So highway overpass, beam girder type bridge. How long do you think it typically takes to design? One to two months, three to six months, six to nine, nine to twelve. Three to six. Three to six. Anybody else want to guess? Six to nine. Depending on the owner, there are some owners that have standard span lengths like the state of Iowa for example so if you get one of these small jobs you don't design anything that's the beam on up all you're designing is a substructure those would be three to six because they have standard plans the substructure is the only thing that's going to change between a lot of these bridges so six to nine they can be done faster they shouldn't really take much more um that's just kind of standard you know multi-span small group bridge not a complex bridge Nine to 12 months, one to two years, two to four, four to six. Sure. Four to six. <laughs> Bit of a trick question. Um, so I would say two to four is the typical. However, you get into these, anything that's over $500 million, you're going to be in the four to six. I have been on, actually, there is a job that we are working on right now. We're hoping for the erection engineering that we started working on with a different company back in 2015. Actual erection is not going to happen until 25 or 26. The demolition of that bridge isn't scheduled until 28. So the big jobs can be huge. At the same time, I also worked on the Kosciuszko Bridge, the very uh, Polish name that uh, I, I made poor Deb pronounce in my intro. Uh, that one we did in nine months, and that was just about unheard of. Now, I don't recommend that. That was a lot of 60-hour work weeks, a lot of overtime, a huge team, a ton of stress. Um, but it can be done. It's just it takes that much more effort. Uh, with a complex bridge, the right answer is it just depends. It depends on where you're at. The other thing, so I'm working on the West Coast more now with my current company. California has to program in time for litigation with every single project they do. <laughs> and so you just know like you're going to lose between six months and a year in litigation um anything that's done east coast and new orleans new orleans is incredibly litigious they will have a line item on their bids for litigation so i uh, you know it just fortunately is where we're at um so another reason that the the big bridges take longer they just carry a lot more risk. And again, we're, we're pushing envelopes, so we don't always know what's going to happen. Environmental loads from a short span to a long span are not linear. So because we know it does this on a 50-foot bridge, we do not know what it's going to do on a 5,000-foot long bridge. Tacoma Narrows is a great example. This was due to wind. And if you 
if you can, if you have time and you're interested, just Google the Tacoma Narrows and watch the video. And to see concrete and steel bend like that is phenomenal, scary. It wasn't designed to happen. No engineer wanted that to happen. We just didn't even know. So there's just a lot that there's, you know, the tools. We've got a lot smart people. We know we can do this. We just don't always know what the impacts are going to be. Um, we do design for very long lifespans. 50 to 100 years is typical on these big bridges because you don't want to replace them soon. But there's still a lot that we don't know. And I would say if any of you know anybody who's into structural research, we need more research on how wind impacts long span structures. We do not have good data to this day. And it's things, so, you know, the bridge barriers, the, the height of the barriers on the side of the bridge that you're driving down, whether that's a six foot high barrier or a 10 foot high barrier, significantly impacts the behavior of the structure. Is it a six foot high barrier with then some like steel tubing on top? That's different than if it's solid. We've had issues when we go to repaint bridges and we tarp the bridge to paint, and all of a sudden we take what was a truss and turn it into a giant sail. And then it's like, oh, like when the bridge starts moving 18 inches and you can see it. We're, we're always learning. We're always still learning. There's just a lot more risk when we get into the bridges. So, again, with the risk, when the bridge is in its final condition, Pretty stable. I would tell my design colleagues, like, that's the easy part. You always have the easy part. You assume it's all there. You just run your loads across it, and, and you're good. When it's the most susceptible is when we're building it or when we're taking it down, and now it's in a partial state. And for a long time, we never even considered this. So I, I have up here the first bridge construction spec. It was published in 1998. The first bridge design spec was published in 1931. Years without even bothering to consider how we're going to build these things. Now, the first bridge demolition spec doesn't exist. Still does not exist. And in fact, as, as Deb mentioned, as of last week, February 7th, 2024, the American Society of Civil Engineers published the first manual practice for bridge demolition engineer, 2024. And this optional, you don't have to follow it. It's kind of the wild, wild west still. A lot of accidents happen that we don't hear about, to be honest. And the construction specifications too. So you have to design a bridge per Ashto. You do not have to build it per Ashto. That's up to the owner. Now there's some states that have good requirements. Uh, the state of Kansas actually had some of the earliest, best bridge construction specifications in the country, on par with that of New York. So if you're from, if you live on the Kansas side, that's a good thing that they're often used as a model because they got out ahead of it. There's other states that still don't bridge demolition, one lump sum, and figure it out. So again, you know, where, where's the risk? Is it in the finished bridge or is it when we're trying to build it? The pylon isn't even done. They still have to build up more. You can see the holes for the new cables that are going to be coming down. So they're basically erecting the deck as they get the, the cables put in. This is uh, the Gordy Howe Bridge between Detroit, Michigan and Windsor, Ontario. Uh, this is the Oakland Bay Bridge coming down. So it's a little hard to see here, but they actually cut it apart here. Most of the floor beams are gone. They've had to put in some temporary members here. And we're just going to lower this thing down and set it on the barge. Now this one's far enough away. If something bad were to happen, it's not going to impact traffic. You can see the new bridges over here, totally new alignment. There's, there's no requirements for this. None. Explosive demo. This is fun. There's a ton of engineering that goes into explosive demolition. I've worked in a couple of these. They, they, it's been some of my favorite projects. There's no regulations here. There's more regulations as far as what you can drop into a river than how you actually do this. This is the FIU bridge collapse. 
that this was 28. Um, th this was actually very complex as far as why it collapsed. It had more to do with design than the actual construction. Again, not good construction specs. This was a privately owned bridge. This was not subject to the Ashto criteria. People died. And when this happened, you could feel the shockwave within my industry. So this happened in the morning. It was on the news. People were on the phone. We were having conversations all day. My company, which wasn't even related to this accident at the time, had multiple conversations. Guidance about media inquiries. Don't talk to anybody. Don't give your opinion. Happen to us. How do we make sure this doesn't happen to us? So the company that I work for now, we specialize in erection and demolition engineering. So we don't work for owners for the most part. We work on the contractor side. So the good contractors understand this risk and they know we need to get some smart folks in here to help us get this thing down. They may or may not be required to do that. And we don't work for, uh, we call them cowboys, the contractors. Are, I do this all the time. I'm getting lucky. We don't work for those types of folks. We work for bigger contractors that have engineers that understand risk. We work on the big projects. We did not work on this one. There's a lot of risk. Well, I have one more, one more slide. And that was, you know, what some observations of what I was surprised about in this career. Um, one, as most engineers don't like to do a lot of writing, reading, being good at writing is absolutely crucial to having a good career in engineering. My deliverable is actually what I can communicate. If I can't get my thoughts, ideas across on paper, it doesn't matter how good of an engineer I am. I do a ton of writing. Technical writing, you know, I'm not writing poetry or prose, but uh, writing is so key to having a good career in engineering. And I don't think you put enough emphasis on that when we're in school. Second thing was the politics. I was not aware how much politics comes into play in engineering. And it's at all levels. So there's internal politics within your company. You know, that's just the office politics. How do you navigate those relationships? There's client politics. How do you, you know, deal with difficult clients, repeat clients, how do you do it work? And there's national level politics. Our infrastructure spending absolutely impacts how much work is in the industry. Somewhat related things that I never would have guessed. Civil engineering on the, the heavy infrastructure side has been very resilient. I personally, as an elder millennial, I have lived through multiple once in a lifetime economic crises. The, the crash of 08, um, obviously the pandemic, the uh, inflation followed since then. And I, I've been lucky, I just haven't really had to worry about it. I've been in a good position. Um, what's the first thing that our country does when we need to stimulate the economy? Put money into it. Like I never would have guessed this, but actually if you're trying to weather a, a, a pandemic or a, a you know market crash, being in first, being in the industry where the government wants to dump money is not a bad place to be. So I, my husband and I both have said, like, we, we we didn't pick our jobs because we knew they would be resilient against all of these things that were to happen. But in hindsight, we, we picked pretty good careers to be resilient. And I think it comes down to more engineering is real and hands-on and tangible. And it's it's been fun to be able to problem solve and see things in the real world. And you know, benefit from the way our economy is set up, but at the same time, do something that feels like it has tangible benefit. Projects impact communities, they impact people. So, um, the observations. But that was all I had. Are there any questions? The bridge that uh, had problems, I don't remember exactly what it was in Philadelphia recently and it was so quick the way they fixed it yes how how could they fix it that fast <laughs> um I, I think I remember the one that you're talking about uh there's been a few recently that we've had so there were spires in California that they got that one open quickly we had the Hernandez 
Fernando de Soto Bridge, which was Tennessee and Arkansas, which that one took longer, but that was still like five months. And then the Philadelphia, um, they were able to get back open. Part of what they did, they decided they were going to prioritize the interstate over the top and not the local. So they backfilled in the road underneath to provide a solid foundation for some of the spans that had collapsed. If these were two interstates that went to work, they basically just said, we're going to shut down the local access for as long as it takes so we can get the interstate back open. So it, it was, it was, I thought it was actually pretty ingenious. If you know, like you can do that, build full of gravel and now it's not a bridge, it's a road. We, we can do that. And then they were able to stage to get the, the bridge back. Why AI is never going to take my job because <laughs> AI only can repeat what's already been done. We are always trying to you know, innovate. Yeah. Well, I'm just curious how So it, it depends on the type of structure and the type of rust. So in, in Kansas City, actually, you'll see we have this called weathering steel bridges. There's quite a few in Overland Park uh, 435 exchange over by like K10 that they look like they're rusted. That's by design. So that is a type of steel that has been, um, you know, the, the chemical makeup is such that it will rust on the outside and the it essentially creates a protective patina. And so you don't have to paint it. And so for those types of bridges, rust isn't a big deal. Um, the bigger concern is, especially when you get into the older bridges that are riveted, rust is a big problem because now you get, it's called pack rust. And so once it starts rusting, it keeps going and then it will actually physically, well, one, it deteriorates the plate, right? Rust happens, it's due to oxidative, oxidization. So now we are losing our structural steel. As it starts to pack in there, it can make it can start to pry the numbers apart and cause issues there too. Um, you'll see a lot of repainting jobs with older bridges where they, you know, tarp the whole thing. The paint is supposed to be a protective coating. Uh, you know, some of those, some bridges, it, it's it's a problem, and they need to address it. Honestly, if you're talking about a 16 to an eighth of an inch section loss, depending on the member, it might not actually be all that big of a deal. Um, one of the things, the way we design bridges, again, this is all statistical analysis. We design it for loads that we think it might eventually see in the future and it won't be exceeded. So when you think about what that means on the actual load on the bridge today, it might only be 50% of what is designed. So all of our infrastructure, we have additional capacity designed in on purpose. So when we get that overloaded truck that should be permitted that isn't, it's okay. Now we can't do that every day because then we get other issues, but um, there is additional capacity in a lot of those structures and, and bridges. Exactly what I'm thinking of. And the like, um, salt water, building over salt water, mm -hmm. like down in Florida Keys, um, those Hugely long yeah. bridges. Uh, so is the salt air a, a factor? Yes. And we have different design factors for marine environments versus non marine environments. So we have to provide more cover. Concrete mix has to meet different standards. So it has less of salt intrusion. Uh, we might require stainless steel rebar. So we don't have to worry about corrosion. Same thing we can do with stainless steel. We can galvanize steel. We can also metallize steel, which um, is new to the infrastructure area. It is not new to marine. So, you know, uh, our marine naval bases have been metallizing for over 50 years. And so that's basically providing a protective zinc coating to the structure. So then the steel doesn't corrode. But yeah, that's part of when you're making design decisions, you have to know where it's being built, what the exposure is, what the risk is and then design for it. You can also provide protection after the fact. Again, if you have an old structure that you know is corroding, you can go in and put in uh, sacrificial cathodes and anodes. 
And so you put in like these zinc pucks. And so now that is going to actually draw the corrosion away because it's all uh, electrical imbalance beyond my area. Like I, I know of it, I've, I've learned about it, but I've never designed one of those systems. So there are ways you can address it even after it started. Yes. Um, I have so many questions. <laughs> this was really, really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing your great points. It's about extreme love bridges. I think, of, for instance, like the bridge between the lower and upper. Yes, that are so long. What would maintenance um, typically look like for a bridge of that expanse? Is it more rigorous than shorter bridges? Sorry, yeah. that's a dumb question. Yeah, no, no, that's a great question. So I know on the Golden Gate Bridge, for example, they're always painting. The minute they get done painting one area, they have to go and paint another area. They are painting the Golden Gate Bridge perpetually. Um, I'm actually working on one of the rehabilitation projects now that involves replacing their inspection travelers. So they have these giant, um, they're like access walkways that are on rollers under the bridge, on the side of the bridge, that go the entire extent of the bridge so we can do these hands-on inspections. And that work started in 2017, expected to be done, I think, in 2006. And then they will go into the next rehab project, which is using those to replace some members. Um, they also have ongoing cable inspection type maintenance. So yeah, the, the large bridges do have more long-term maintenance costs. But again, you have to offset that with what they're providing. And so, you know, the most of these, a lot of these bridges like Golden Gate. Um, a lot of the New York bridges, the, the Mackinac Bridge is the one that uh, you're referring to. They have their own owners, their own districts. So they will have a group that's just dedicated to that bridge. So the Golden Gate Bridge is not owned by the state of California. It is owned by the Golden Gate District. And the only thing the Golden Gate District owns is that bridge. And so, yeah, it's they have full-time engineers just dedicated to that bridge. Kind of a silly question, <clears throat> but uh, obviously those working on bridges are very talented in many respects, and I'm sure that the companies have also stuff designated to keep them hanging high over water. But is there ever a test of a potential worker how they react to high heights? It, not an airline, since so that's very different, but when they must be hanging on to something. And I mean, would be, <laughs> yeah, but that, I'm fine with flying. That, that's interesting. Um, what yeah. does it matter? Do they know about themselves? I would love to hang in a couple of wires. I, I think there, there are people that really love that work mm -hmm. that are rope certified that like doing that. Um, we also have underwater bridge inspectors that not yeah. only are they licensed engineers, they are certified scuba divers to do underwater inspections. Um, you know, if, if you're claustrophobic, I don't think you go to get your PADI certification to be uh, an underwater bridge inspector. Um, now, so obviously these uh, uh, mental issues are addressed. Yeah, and it's going to be different depending on who you work for and the type of work you do. If you work for a typical consulting firm, you probably can go your whole career without having to work at height. Uh -huh. And it's something you can probably get around. The company that I work for now, we do a lot of, again, construction and demolition engineering. A lot of what we do is in the field. So we provide on-site support. Um, the last project I was on site for just this last fall, uh, some of it was at a, a bridge that's over water and we were you know, doing some removal. So you had to have on a five point safety harness if you were up on and you're clipped off the pipeline. The other part is out on a barge. So if you're afraid of water or you know things like that, again, um, big barges can be pretty stable. Small barges are not so stable. Uh, 
there, there's a little bit, I think, of self-selection yeah. in it. And, you know, for my company, if we had somebody that just said, like, there's just absolutely no way I can go work at Heights or be on a barge, try to make it work. But it might just be one like that's this part of the job. And it is in our job description that we provide mm -hmm. on site service. You go to work for a contractor, or there are groups that just specialize in ropes inspection. Obviously, that's the job you're going for. You better be okay it's, hanging yeah. from a, a harness off a, a bridge or the Washington Monument or whatever it might be. So is there are there many women in a bridge construction? Uh, I'm whatever. No, <laughs> no. Um, I think you know it, it's getting better, but I think we've been saying it's getting better for at least twenty or thirty years. Um, I think my company has three full-time engineers out of seventeen total, so that's not terrible numbers. Um, Industry-wide, it typically is about twelve or fifteen percent. And what we found, and again, this has been going on for 20, we can get up to maybe 20% in the younger engineers, mm -hmm. and we lose them all by mid-career. I think it's by year seven, most of the women leave. Um, there's very few at high levels. I was at a design firm before I switched companies, and there, there was not a single female technical engineer above me. Was as someone with you know 12 to 15 years of experience. Um, started a list to see best I a woman has never stamped a cable state bridge in this country. Um, there's probably other you know benchmarks too. And it's not that we don't have the talent and we don't have the pipeline, it's a culture issue. Mm -hmm. Um, that's why we have a lot up until that seven-year mark and get frustrated when I hear, well, there's just no good women to promote because that's garbage. Uh, it's a bigger... That was my next question. I'm glad you addressed it. No, I'm it's it, it comes back to culture. Now, one other thing that I find incredibly fascinating, I've never had a problem with a contractor, whether it's a field guy or whether it's their superintendent. I've never had issues with a contractor. Right. They've actually always treated me really well and I feel like they trust me more because I'm a woman like I'm not going to try to screw them over right I I only have their best interest in mind um and I don't feel like they give the men that same level of trust so I, I do think there's some interesting dichotomy there I've had more issues with one non-engineers that are completely outside of the industry um and then I've had, you know, I, I've seen more issues internally with just leadership. And it's the, the common, well, you just don't have the right experience. <laughs> then my male counterpart, well, he has really good potential. <laughs> so it's, um, you know, we're, we're working on it. Where I'm at right now, I have to say I've been really impressed. Again, we are much more um, contractor client focused. And they, when I first started there, I was surprised at how much they trusted me. It's like, you mean I don't need to? Like, no, we trust you. It's fine. Um, have a high degree of trust. And so it's not, you can't just say like across the board, it's one thing or another. Um, it, it's been interesting. There are not that many women in the technical side, especially. A lot of the women in engineering that do get to higher levels end up going more management. Besides that path, I think women make excellent project managers for a lot of different reasons, um, but they don't tend to stay on the technical side. And I think it's, it's difficult, you know, when, when there's, I asked my last job, I asked my boss, find me. Bill mentor. Well, wow, there, there's people. Really? Give me her name. In, introduce me. I will send the email. I don't even care. Give give me a name. Ooh. Oh. And it, it's a struggle. Um, you know, I try to be a mentor to the younger women in my company. Um, I I have a few, you know, women that I know that have made it. 
the great places. And I have a few other um, colleagues that are still on the design side that, you know, we are each other's cheerleaders because we're all, feels like we're doing this, you know, blind leading the blind. It's like, no, you're doing great. <laughs> oh. And then when the days are tough and it's, well, let's, let's go grab a, a drink and we'll talk it out or something. It's that, that support is really important, but I still, I enjoy it. I, I enjoy my job a lot. Um, it's just great opportunities. You know, my kids see women in engineering as a normal thing. You know, they daughter is is excellent at math, and she's like, somebody told me girls aren't good at math. Like, I'm just you know, what what does your mom do for a living, right? Don't listen to them. Girls are good at math. That's early. Where do you live? You have a job that goes all over the state. Uh, we we live here in Kansas City. So my company's based out of Boulder, but I work remote. Um, you know, and it, it's one really, as long as you can get to an airport, you can go anywhere. We do a lot remote, especially now with the pandemic, we know we can. So we provide on-site services when needed, but um, we're, we're not a regional firm. And there's, there's a handful of other firms similar to ours. There's one here in Kansas City where I started my career early. And they're the same, you know, they have, I think, 18, 20 employees, they work all over the country. And it's when you're good at what you do, you get to leverage, you know, those projects. It makes sense to call up somebody out of Colorado or out of Kansas City when it's a New York project if they're the best at what they do. So that's, I also tell my my kids and um, the younger students that I mentor, find a niche and be, then you will have so many opportunities, but you gotta, you gotta figure out what you want to do and just make sure you're the best at it. Or always, you know, try to be improving to be the best. And you get to kind of lay your own career. Like the sense you know, we work with, um, our universities have these programs and great instruction. Well, I, I am quite biased. Uh, for undergrad programs, you know, University of Wisconsin Platteville is one of the best. They they are actually very uh, excellent for undergrad programs. Um, there are some universities that have better structures programs than others. So Iowa State has always historically had a strong structure program. Uh, University of Iowa has always had a strong environmental engineering program. Um, It varies in a lot of it, just depends on who's doing what in research. Um, there, there are schools that we do recruit from. You know, some of it's based on proximity, but again, like Virginia Tech has an excellent program. We get, we, we have a, a student, or a, she's not a student anymore. Um, one of my coworkers is from there, you know, master's degree at Virginia Tech. We do prefer master's degree, which is, um, a lot of engineering design you can do with a bachelor's degree. When you get into structures, when you get into geotech, um, a master's degree is really preferred. You just you need that additional education. And so it's, I think, you have a master's degree. And then also, did you do a thesis or did you do a terminal master's? And we've had that discussion too. And it's, again, my my husband has a PhD. I'm obviously slightly biased, but I will... I, I will take the full thesis master's over a terminal master's any day of the week. It shows up in how to set their own internal deadlines. Do they know how to, you know, meet deliverables? Have they done any amount of technical writing? Um, it's a lot more rigorous than doing a project-based master's. I I probably preach to the choir here. I would assume since you well, obviously all value education, but. We see it in in practice. There is a difference, and so I don't know that I can say there's there's some universities that are better than others. But really, if you get a master's degree and you do a research project with a thesis, you will most likely be a, a good candidate. What we do. room presumably remembers the Hyatt hotel collapse. Um, how, how do engineers 
respond when they're asked about that? Respond when they're asked about. Oh, that's that's a great question, and you know, so that is one of the most famous collapses in instructional engineering. I would say I'm sorry. But I taught it when I taught static, you know, 200 level engineering course. Um, when my husband and I first moved down here, we had to go see it. You know, like I read about this, learned about this. It it's huge and. It's interesting here in Kansas City because I had met a handful of people that were first responders or, you know, had their dad was, you know, firsthand knowledge of being on the scene. Happen. There's no excuse. It shouldn't have happened. Um, the, the system failed. And I can say the level of scrutiny that we're under now is much more what we have to do for quality control, for checking. Um, you know, generally speaking, nothing can go out that two qualified sets of eyes haven't looked at. Now, in that case, that was a guy that didn't look at it long enough and just said, okay, nobody else looked at it. You can see how he made the decision he did. The original design was a terrible detail from a constructability standard. So that's what happens. We have this detail in the contract. There's no way we can build this. This is what we want to do instead. And I got off on it. I don't believe he was the original design engineer either. He was in charge and he stamped it and said, yeah, I, I get it. What was originally designed was not constructible. Go ahead. He didn't look through far enough to see that the modification increased the loads on the specific member. But again, as a human going through, I completely understand what happened. Didn't look long enough. He didn't have anybody second guess him or you know check his work. And unfortunately, it was a fatal decision. It shouldn't have happened. Completely preventable. That by you, bridge collapse too, shouldn't have happened. So a whole bunch of errors that could have prevented that. And nobody felt empowered to stand up and say, hey, I think there's something wrong here. And people died. So I you would respond to the families and just say, we failed. I mean, because to say that we'll learn from it and we'll try to be better, but that feels really shallow and inadequate. You're talking about loss of life. The goal is that it doesn't happen, right? It doesn't happen here in the U.S. Like that happens in other parts of the world where there aren't any controls in engineering. It doesn't happen. It shouldn't happen here. It's scary to know that that can still happen. As long as humans are the ones that are designing and building things, though, it's always going to be a risk. We will never have zero risk. But again, this is now we make sure qualified people are looking at this. We have a system to check everything. Uh, I feel like it's less likely to happen. You know, I, I hope I can get that in my career. Um, at the public trust. fair for the public to say for a while we don't trust you and we wanted to know more we want more transparency i i think that's a completely fair i think the only thing that we can do is kind of go open our books and say look this is what we're doing we have more licensing requirements we have continuing education requirements um you know again internal quality control policies we have owner so that's now a third set of eyes you know, sometimes the owner will hire an independent engineer. That's not a fourth set of eyes. For a lot of this highly critical, like the complex bridges, you better believe that there is not a single thing on any one of those bridges that at least half a dozen qualified people have not looked at, scrutinized, argued over, revised, come back and double check. 
but that doesn't always happen on the smaller stuff too. And actually, that's one of the the things that we have in in the on the construction side. The big engineered pick. So if you see, you know, a crane, tower crane, having something big, heavy, risky, because they're fully engineered. They have a set of plans. They have a pre lift meeting. Got all of your qualified people in place. The place where accidents happen is when they're going to pick up a pallet of bricks to move it from over here to over here, and nobody's really paying attention, and it isn't secured, and they aren't, you know, aware of what's going around, going on around them. Something comes loose. It falls down. It hits and kills a worker. And so it's be better, but man, humans are just messy in general. With that hopeful note. <laughs> <laughs>